a very good afternoon to everybody my name is shakti sena you can't see me because my computer is misbehaving but it's all right you don't have to see me today we have an excellent discussion today but before i go on to let me very quickly as those of you who are listening in would have known that i mentioned that we do this we meaning the atal bihari bajpayee institute of policy research and international studies at the maharaja sayaji rao university of baroda we are very new we actually become really active only since june and right now what we are basically doing is every week we do a webinar on friday evenings normally otherwise sometimes a little earlier in the day depending on the speakers and we cover one week we do public policy and the other week we do international studies and a broader thing you know we also look around and uh, despite the fact that i'm senior citizen i try and get as many non senior citizens also of course today's speakers you know is very well established but even otherwise i look for people who are not well established but who are actually have a lot of potential because that is the time for us to engage with them and really you know give them the platforms rather than wait for them to become well established and then go hunting for them and for a younger audience especially if we are located out of delhi out to metro lapatan areas our audience is also slightly different not all of course some of it so that makes it all the more exciting for us now today our two speakers dr constantino xavier popularly known as tino tino is a fellow at the in foreign policy and security studies at the center for social and economic progress new delhi is also a non resident fellow at the brookings institution and today we are going to discuss a project that he leads called sambandh initiative on regional connectivity it basically examines india's political security economic relations with the neighborhood where connectivity i think is a very strong one he is also i'm glad to say writing a book on how democratic values influence india's foreign policy and doing case studies of again of india's neighborhood nepal sri lanka myanmar based on a lot of archival material news sources and interviews he is in part of many policy dialogues involving india and europe and other indo pacific powers and is published everywhere outstanding compilations like the oxford handbook on foreign policy the routledge handbook on china india relations and is taught and lectured at various institutions all over india he's also got he was also he has also been a full bright fellow scholar and iccr he holds a phd in south asian studies from john hopkins university and the ma and m phil from jnu school of international studies he's a research associate riya sinha also of course of cs the cscp uh cv says five years experience in research and regional integration I think it's longer. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it should be longer. But I'll leave it at that. But basically, working on trade investments, how basically all this border issues, trans-border issues, ports, connectivity, etc. How do they feed into it? She does work on the cross line of LOC trade also, Jammu Kashmir, and a fair amount of time release studies across various ports, ease of doing business. So let me not take more time. If we request Dr. Xavier and Ria to take over, do their presentations, and then, as usual, after thirty thirty-five minutes, say thirty thirty-five, yeah, that's good enough. We'll open it up for Q and A. So over to you, Tino, Ria, and welcome once again, and welcome all the viewers. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sena. Or should I say, Shakti Ji? It's really a pleasure, and uh, we're here for many reasons today. Uh, but we're here particularly because of you, uh, and let me start with that word of gratitude towards you, not only for inviting us here today, but I think uh, I hope to speak also for Ria. I know actually in this case with certainty I don't like to speak for other people, but I think uh, uh, Ria will share with me uh, the sense of gratitude we have towards you uh, in our recent years of work. more or less established uh, more or less upcoming or not i think uh, through several years now uh, you have guided us you have helped us you have encouraged us uh, and i think that is encouraging for us it's encouraging for many other scholars younger not so young that are trying to do work on india's public policies 
on India's foreign and security policies, on India's regional policy, uh, in our case. So thank you for that help and that encouragement and support. And thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. It's a great pleasure to, to join you all here um, today um, at the Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Policy Research and International Studies, IPRIS, at the Maharaja Sayavijrao University of Baroda. Um, uh, thank you to Professor Parimal Vyas, the Vice Chancellor, also to Professor Amit Tulakya, who I see is joining us here today and is the Joint Director of this Institute. It's uh, excellent to take these discussions, I think you mentioned it in, our, in the introduction, out of Delhi, we're both based in Delhi, but also to universities that are doing such important work on political science, international relations across India and the many states and cities of India. So what we'll do today um, is we'll, we'll uh, speak about a project we have called Samband, um, which focuses on a particular increasingly central aspect of India's neighborhood first policy or India's neighborhood policy, which is the aspect of regional connectivity, integration, cooperation across this subcontinent. So we'll try to share a bit of the uh, history of India's neighborhood policies uh, over the last 70, 75 years. Uh, and we'll also try to share some of the research findings that uh, uh, our publications um, uh, feature of the last one to two year, one year now that we've been working on this initiative. So we have a variety of publications, some co-authored, some with other, by other scholars at the Center for Social and Economic Progress, formerly Brookings India, uh, that you know, feature different aspects of regional connectivity. But uh, over to you, Ria, quickly to maybe also say a few welcome words and introduce yourself. You know, and um, thank you, Shakti, sir. I think I started my career with working with you and it's a great pleasure to have, uh, to speak here at this platform for the AIPRIS. And um, I, don't, I completely echo what Tino has just said. Um, we do owe you a lot of gratitude for your support throughout the years and it's a pleasure to be speaking here. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. And uh, let me highlight again, it's not only about mentoring and encouraging, you know, the work that I think Ria and I believe in and that the Center for Social and Economic Progress as a not-for-profit Indian public policy institution stands for is to try to bridge the wonderful work that is done in academic institutions like yours. I see many students and faculty joining us here, solid research at university uh, level with the world of practice, where I think policymakers like Mr. Shakti Sinha every day are battling with probably recurrent problems that are not new. I think these problems and issues and challenges and objectives uh, for a better, stronger, more prosperous India and South Asia and the region are recurrent. They come from the past, they're here in the present, they'll come over and over again. And to bridge those two worlds is something that like, we enjoy doing and we try to do. And to do that, we rely a lot on both these worlds. We, we have a foot in each, which is not easy, but we rely on good university professors and methodologies and our training that we both have from an academic level. But we also have to have a foot in the world of Mr. Sinha and all the other Mr. Sinhas that are in the government of India across different ministries, different civil services, foreign services, administrative services, and the military across the Indian state that are practicing and implementing uh, India's public policies in the region and in the external domain. So uh, let's pull up the presentation, maybe, uh, Ria, and, and get started. You know, Thank you. Yeah, I think it should be visible. So we'll we'll stick to thirty five minutes. We'll try to do really compress this. So bear with us. It'll be intense, fast, and a glimpse of what we do. And I think we can always go back to some of the slides if you wish. Show in the Q and A uh, and go deeper into some of the issues. But we hope to maximize the time to discuss with you, to answer your questions, your doubts, your interests in the Q&A. Um, so Ria, let's go to the next slide. Uh, 
please. Yeah, so I think let's start with this quote, you know, which will have a first part, which will speak a bit about India's India and the region. And then the second part, where we'll feature some of our research and findings on India's neighborhood policy. This first part, you know, I, I like to start with this quote by K. Shankar Bajpai, who joined the Indian Foreign Service uh, in 1952 after independence. Uh, he was one of the most senior, most prominent uh, uh, Indian diplomats who served in a variety of positions worldwide. But I chose this statement here uh, because I think it really conveys the complex, complexity, the difficulty uh, that any Indian decision maker faces while dealing with South, the South Asian environment, the region. Forget the states for a second, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal. Think of this as a region. That's why, again, we've chosen this map here, which gives you a physical appearance of also the diversity, the ecological and geographic diversity of this, of this region. And uh, Ambassador Bajpai is telling us basically that we have, you know, India has more neighbors than most countries around the world, seven by land, three by sea. These are immediate neighbors, like the ones we share a land or maritime border with. You have jungles, mountains, deserts, oceans that connect or separate India from these countries. There's different religions, ideologies, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, communism, just to mention a few. They animate them, they drive them. Sometimes they shape the state identity in the case of say Bangladesh or Pakistan uh, with Islam. We must deal with the military dictatorships, different political regimes. So in Pakistan, in Myanmar, you had long uh, military autocracies. You have monarchies. Let's not forget that Nepal and Bhutan were you know, absolute monarchies till the 90s, 2000s that only faced you know, a change in regime very recently. We have Marxist democracy, communist movements in and out of the country. The Maoists, for example, in Nepal that you know, uh, reformed and joined the mainstream. Sometimes he says happily, sometimes happily, I think shows also India's preference, a real democracy. And I think here he's also alluding to another real democracy like we are. Uh, this is rare, he's saying, and rarely, happily, we find another democracy. The geographic and political complexity of South Asia is exceptional. And he's saying he's comparing this to other regions of the world, Europe, parts of Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia. So this is extraordinary, the geographic and political, social, economic complexity of this region. And to do that, you require three skills or three sort of features as a diplomat. Knowledge, you need to know about your neighbors. You need to know a lot about their history, their culture. You also have to have skill, competence in navigating this complexity, these changes in government, these cross-border ethnicities and religions that are sort of you know, transcending the political borders of the region. And you also need flexibility, which I think is a very important underrated aspect of diplomacy and particularly of Indian diplomacy. He's saying you need flexibility, which, is, which means we need to be, um, have maximum maneuvering ground. Uh, people often, you will notice in media analysis, call it a U-turn. They love this term. India, India is doing a U-turn on Afghanistan. India is doing a U-turn on Nepal. India is doing a U-turn on Myanmar. Always you see this. But my, my sense is that I've never been a diplomat, but I've studied 70 years of Indian diplomacy. And I can tell you, Diplomacy is pretty much made of constant U-turns or adjustments, if you want, and, and, and that flexibility you need. If your environment changes, the only thing you should not be doing is persist in a stubborn way with one policy. If the environment changes, if circumstances changes, you may have your preferences, your principles, your sunk cost, if you want to use an economic theorem that you already invested in a certain way in a government, in a policy. But the least intelligent thing to do is to stick to that if the circumstances have changed just because you want to continue the way you have been on it. Let's move to the next slide. Good, having taken that out of the ground, you know, I, I, I'll tell you I'm a big fan of looking at the Indian state in its lines of continuity. What I mean is that often people think that India's foreign policies change overnight because a new prime minister has come into power. That India's foreign policies change because a different political party has shaped the government. 
that India's foreign policy changes because, you know, somehow India was naive in the past, is more intelligent now, or the opposite, India was extremely glorious in the past and today is reactionary. You know, I think that if you read history, you will notice, you know, a famous saying that I think President Truman of the U.S. liked very much and enjoyed. He, he quoted Plutarch, uh, the old philosopher, by saying that the only, his, only thing new in the world, the only things new that we see that are really novel, often are just the history that we don't know. So there's an illusion of newness often, and certainly there's transformation, there's change, there's evolution, there's adaptation. But if you learn, and if you read about Indian history in foreign policy, you'll actually find more lines of continuity, consensus, than uh, you would expect if you just look at the immediate issues. So here, for example, three prime ministers in three different eras of the country, Prime Minister Nehru in the 1950s, addressing in par the parliament, actually saying that, you know, supposedly a utopian, idealist, Nehru is so much in vogue these days that we like to criticize the first prime minister of India, saying that he was a dreamer, he was an idealist. Uh, but he's actually saying here, for example, that, you know, whatever happens in Nepal affects the security of India. And therefore, the security frontier of India begins on the Nepal-China border, not on the India-Nepal border. This is a very bold statement. You're basically saying, you know, formally, yes, Nepal is independent, but not really. Nepal actually, its security of Nepal begin and security of India are complementary and begin in the Himalayas to the north of the Indian political border. Second, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh talking again about what K. Shankar Bajpai was saying about knowledge about the neighborhood. He's addressing the probationers here in 2008 at the Foreign Service Institute of India who are joining the Foreign Service. And he was saying, we, could, we do not know enough about what goes on in our neighborhood. And unfortunately, we are excessively influenced by Western perceptions of what's happening in Nepal and Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Yeah. We don't have often the knowledge, or I would say even we've forgotten. You had excellent South Asia experts in India up to the 80s, 90s at universities but I feel for many reasons I will not get into, there's been a slowdown in that, a disconnection from the region. And now slowly, I think India is reconnecting with the region. The neighborhood is becoming something interesting to study again. We see younger people engaging with the neighboring countries and really developing their own expertise and Indocentric expertise, if you want, at Indian academic institutions, at Indian civil society organizations, in government, about India's neighbors. Finally, the Prime Minister Modi at the 2014 SARC summit, you know, focused on this term that we're going to explore here today too much, uh, a lot, which is uh, the issue of connectivity through economic issues, trade and investment and development cooperation, uh, but also civil society connectivity, also uh, a political connectivity, diplomatic connectivity, security connectivity. And therefore that the recognition, which is again, not new, but is emphasized, I'd say, particularly under the neighborhood first policy since 2014, that the destiny of India is inextricably tied to the destiny of its neighbors, all of its neighbors. And I would include even China here, especially China. But therefore there's a shared opportunity that needs to sort of be, needs to be developed. So explaining a bit, you know, why we have this puzzle of disconnectivity in the region, which makes the region again exceptional. But one of the reasons I think that India insulated itself from the region is found not in ideology and politics per se, but in the economic model that India adopted post 1960s in particular, fifth, late 50s, 60s onwards, which was an autarkic socialist planned economy that was not focused on interdependence, on trade, on investments, on the private sector, Right? That economic model for India did not recognize an interest in greater infrastructure connectivity with its neighbors. If you don't trade with Nepal, if there's no interest in trading with Nepal, you will not develop your railways, your roads, your inland waterways, your airports, your people-to-people -people connectivity with Nepal. And that was a state, I think, of affairs for many decades between the 60s and the 90s in India where there was no interest. It was not that you, neg you neglected it, but there was a reason why you neglected it. It was not just you forgot about South Asia. There was no incentive. There was no incentive to trade. In fact, Sri Lanka in the 1980s opened up its economic, its economy before India did. It started 
you know, teetering with reforms and trying to emulate the Singapore model from the early 1980s uh, and went ahead. Even in Nepal, there were slight experiments with opening up the country to more trade with the rest uh, of the world beyond India from the 1980s, which again led to some irritants with India. But here are a few examples, just you can go through of what we find as telling examples of how even up, in re up to in recent years, uh, you carry on this legacy, this burden of disconnectivity. And I think all of you in your international relations courses have possibly, uh, I'm sure, studied some of the modules about regionalism in world politics. And that is a period that began post-World War II, the 1950s in Europe, and the European Economic Community, and then the European Union. You have the uh, various regional experiments in South America uh, with the Mercosur. You have NAFTA and the North American Free Trade Organization and integration efforts in North America. You have ASEAN in Southeast Asia, founded in the late 1960s, that developed into a very strong regional organization uh, uh, up to today. Uh, so you have a variety of regionalisms and integration of different regions. It's the golden area of regional blocks uh, interdependence. And at the same time, what is happening in South Asia is India, India is exactly going into the different direction. Uh, by many standards, India was more connected to its neighbors, including East Pakistan, for example, right? An hostile enemy state in the 1950s than it, it was in the 1990s. So you're moving backwards in terms of regional integration organization. Some of you may point to South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC in the 1980s, but that's a very late uh, entrant and a very weak organization that is actually among the weakest regional organizations comparatively speaking. So this is a state of, of disconnectivity. Visas are difficult to get. It's more expensive to ship containers to next door Bangladesh than all the way to Singapore. The number of railway links decreased between India and Bangladesh from the ninth, from 12 to around one in the mid 2000s. Now I think we're up to four again. Intra-regional trade in South Asia, that is the amount of commercial uh, exchanges between South Asian countries is 5% compared to around 30% in Southeast Asia. So all of this gives you this legacy of disconnectivity that uh, is apparent uh, since the 1990s, 2000s. What changes? You know, a lot of people speak about China all the time. China shows up, China's in Sri Lanka, China's in Myanmar, China's in Bangladesh, China's in Nepal. You know, we hear that. And I'm not undermining that and neglecting it. I think we have to recognize that the formidable financial footprint of China and South Asia over the last 10 years, in particular over the last six to seven years since the Belt and Road Initiative has been established, uh, to which all of India's neighbors except Bhutan joined has been an important factor for India to prioritize the name. But that's a story of reaction. It's China is doing something, so India is waking up and saying we need to do more. And in fact, India was already doing a lot since the 1990s, if you look at the Gujral Doctrine in the late 90s, if you look at the Vajpayee government and its focus on the neighborhood and on Myanmar, for example, uh, with Jasvan Singh and the beginning of the Look East policy. If you look at the uh, uh, South Asian regionalism and the various art various initiatives under Manmohan Singh in 2004 onwards, it's 2004, 2008, three, good four, three, four good years after that, a bit downhill for many other reasons, including the difficult relations with Pakistan, but there was a movement. But the sense of urgency increases with China, the rise of China and South Asia. Second factor that I think India uh, makes India prioritize the neighborhood is the economic factor. And this I think is more important in fact. It's something, it's something that you know, people neglect or don't talk much about. They prefer the big grand game of India-China competition. But it is really India's economic openness since the 1990s that is driving the agenda of connectivity in the region. Uh, whether that's the South Asia Free Trade Association in the 2000s, whether it is the emphasis on BIMSTEC, which is not a new thing. BIMSTEC was founded in 1997. Uh, it was actually more active in the 2000s. Then again, it went into a lull and slowdown, and now it's come up again. Uh, the BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal initiative, which is a quadrilateral that was actually formed in the late 90s as a South Asia economic growth quadrangle, and then now has been sort of uh, developed into an intergovernmental uh, four-country uh, initiative on connectivity. 
All of these initiatives are driven by the interest in trading more with each other, the interests in investing more in each other, the interests in developing transportation infrastructure to trade more with each other. In Indian states, not only the central government, the union government, but Indian border states taking on the leading role in, in connecting with provinces and states across borders. For example, UP and Bihar today recognize it's in their interest to trade more with Nepal and have inland waterway connectivity with Nepal. Assam today has a strong relation with Bangladesh and is developing its own sort of para-state foreign policy towards Bangladesh. You have, for example, to give another example, the opening of two new consulates in Guwahati today uh, from Bhutan and Bangladesh. So Bhutan and Bangladesh finally have their own diplomatic representation in Assam because they're recognized as an interest to trade more and connect more with each other through India, through Assam. Finally, I think another driver, of course, is the sense of culture, history, and trying to reconnect to a region that has a certain cultural, religious, civilizational similarity. And this is interpreted in many different ways, uh, but certainly I'd say under this current government, uh, uh, under Prime Minister Modi, there's been a particular emphasis on cultural connectivity, for example, using Buddhism as a tool in foreign policy uh, and reconnecting culturally with your neighbors uh, in South Asia. Ria, over to you. From here, I would like to take you on certain examples of progress of the of India's neighborhood policies, some under neighborhood first and some before it. The idea behind this is to make you understand that there is a lot happening at the ground level, which is not always, you know, which does not always form the front page of a newspaper. But given given the um, the momentum on the ground, there is. Um, there is a need to identify that movement is taking place, that the policy has certain success factors and to, and to sort of build upon these success factors. The first that I would like to focus on is there's an increased focus on building hard infrastructure and connectivity with the neighboring countries. By this, I mean building integrated check posts, um, road connectivity, rail connectivity, inland waterways, um, even pipelines, for example, and here are certain examples of those connectivity. Since 2010, we have a total of nine integrated check posts to facilitate trade and passenger movement with the neighboring countries, out of which two have been inaugurated in just the last two years. One with India Nepal, which is at Jogbani Viratnagar, and the second is at Moray with Myanmar. Railway connections with Bangladesh, as Tino was alluding to earlier, has today increased to six. The Haldibari Chilahati railway connection was the most recent one to be inaugurated. South Asia also inaugurated its first petroleum pipeline in, uh, with Nepal um, between Motihari and Amlekanj. And we are now also discussing a second pipeline with Nepal as well as with Bangladesh. Inland waterway routes, the pilot projects have been conducted for the last several years. And now we have operational inland waterway routes between Bangladesh and the northeastern states, particularly Tripura. First South Asia satellite was launched as a, as a regional connectivity initiative. We have an air cargo corridor with Afghanistan. And most and very importantly, new connections, our old connections are being revived. For example, the flight from India in Jaffna landed in almost after 40 years. And it's not just hard infrastructure connectivity, which is undergoing change, but the approach of the government is also changing towards the neighborhood. For example, Prime Minister Modi has visited twice as many uh, neighboring countries compared to his predecessors. And in 2018, we had the first ever Indian defense minister visit to Bangladesh. Reciprocal visits are also taking place. Um, very recently, the Indian High Commissioner to Bangladesh, uh, Ambassador Vikram Dorai Swami, he met the governor or, of Assam in order to an, increase these connectivity projects, in order to build on these connectivity projects. And Assam is a very important stakeholder in that. Uh, furthermore, several organizational changes have taken place within, um, within different ministries, um, bilaterally with different countries, our um, bilateral mechanism, bilateral information sharing mechanisms have increased. Um, the MEA in 2019 established the Indo-Pacific Division in light with the whole geopolitical agenda and in order to facilitate various connectivity initiatives. 
Tino also like I'm like Tino and I mentioned Assam is a very important stakeholders and states themselves are um, are taking steps to increase connectivity with the neighboring countries. In this case, for example, Assam established its own at East Division, and the neighboring countries also are opening consulates in the smaller city in smaller Indian cities. In addition to this, institutional developments have also taken place in the last several years. SARC, as we know, is not functioning as we would have liked to, despite its potential. So um, in the words of our foreign minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, SARC or any other alternative. And here it comes in the form of PIMSTEC or the BBIN grouping. India also ratified the TIR convention in 2017, which basically means that cross-border customs um, we have common procedures for cross-border customs. It's not such that India has a, India will have a different customs procedure and Nepal will have another. While that remains the case right now, we are moving towards streamlining that. The electronic cargo clearance system for Nepalese, Nepali transit cargo from the Indian seaports of Kolkata and Vaisak has been streamlined. And various la and land boundary agreement and coastal shipping agreement with Bangladesh is, an, is a very important development. Not just with the neighboring countries, even internally, India is um, providing several incentives to improve connectivity, to, uh, to improve connectivity and to encourage the private sector to invest in the neighboring countries. Border areas are particularly important in this and financial allotments in the form of um, under the border area development program and the NHIDCL, which builds roads, which builds roads and is now venturing into some highways is increasing. Uh, India also launched the concessional finance scheme to support companies that bid uh, for strategic projects in the neighboring countries. And of course, there have been investments in rail and road expansion in Northeast states, many with the help of third country cooperation. And this brings us to how this is important for Indo-Pacific cooperation as well. India is implementing several projects um, in cooperation with third countries like Japan and the US, which have become important stakeholders in this regional connectivity agenda. And finally, the COVID-19 response has been the most recent uh, successful to some extent example of um, India's regional connectivity, the One Day Bharat Mission supply of essential goods. New, new routes were opened with Bhutan so that essential goods could be supplied in a timely manner. Until the time we could, we were supplying vaccine to the neighboring countries as well. These are just some of the examples of how India has increased its space of operations, um, its space of connectivity with the neighboring countries. However, that does not discount the fact that while more than ever is being done right now, there is an increasing demand by the, by the smaller South Asian countries particularly, and there is a competition in the neighborhood for space. So what can be done to support, uh, what can be done to support India in building uh, on, its, on the success story so far? First is that we need quality data. We need good, um, I have seen a good amount of government data in the last few years, and it has been a challenge. We need good quality data available publicly to study, to build on, to infer from, so that our policies can be more streamlined. Additionally, we need inputs from different Indian government branches. It's not just the MEA anymore that leads, um, that leads foreign policy. You need inputs from different branches of government. You need, um, for trade, for example, you need MEA and, and Ministry of Commerce cooperation and so on. And we have Antino and I will come to a study uh, that we had done about it later under the Sambad initiative. But this coordination between different government branches at the central level, as well as the state level is very important. Then engagement of private sectors and the different domestic constituencies is another factor um, that, that's needed for holistic development of connectivity. And constructive engagement with neighboring countries is a very, very important factor in taking this forward. Building on this, building on the need for quality data, we. Um, we started the Samband initiative and Tino is gonna take us through it. Thank you, Ria. And I'd like to emphasize uh, uh, three, three things. One is, uh, as you can notice now, uh, the line between domestic and foreign policy is not that clear when you talk about South Asia. I'd say when you talk about most things on foreign policy, 
Uh, and obviously when we go to university, we compartmentalize political science, international relations and South Asia and Southeast Asia. But you know, if you look at this map and it's all, we've, used in a lot, we've used a lot of these geophysical maps without those white lines or red lines, you know, crossing across deserts and jungles and seas, you really look at this as an ecosystem, as a social system, this region, right? People that have aspirations, ambitions, whether it is moving around freely, whether it is developing, attending good schools and universities, finding employment, uh, being safe and secure in their land, in their location. So I think this is the first aspect that what is happening in many ways what we're mapping here is a way that India is reintegrating with its region and its neighbors also are reintegrating. And all borders are artificial. I'm always puzzled when some people say, look at the map of Africa and those maps are all colonially made and artificial as if they were natural borders. There's no such thing as a natural political border. All political borders are made, imagined, but certainly settled uh, and, and negotiated and you know, fought for. And uh, so therefore, I think that's the first aspect that you, I think you need to look at this region from that holistic interdependent perspective. Uh, uh, and that is uh, in the interest of India too, to have that perspective to deal with these flows. The second thing is, I think, uh, the sec issue of a paradox. I think you will see every week there will be one item of news about India winning the neighborhood or India losing the neighborhood, about some amazing success or some horrible defeat. And it's always about some pro or anti-Indian leader being elected. It's about China managing to do something. It is about security. It's about a Chinese submarine. It's about uh, um, some type of a free trade agreement. It's always those big political macro issues. And what I think this brings out uh, and the work we're trying to do is that, you know, India is actually doing more than ever, uh, trying to correct decades of really insulation, disconnectivity and neglect. And that takes a lot of time. You cannot do that in four, five, six, 10, 10, 20 years. It will take a long time. This is a process of reintegration of 1.3 billion people with a region that has over 2 billion people, one third of, almost one fourth of humanity. And with the scale at which we're thinking things is therefore very, very large. And these small successes, these basic successes are unknown to most people. When you ask them, what about India's neighborhood first policy? Right? They'll talk about SARC, about elections, about pro or anti-Indian leaders, but they will not be able to understand that you do not have today an operating passenger rail link between India and Nepal. Right? That is you know, exceptional. Uh, India just has inaugurated the line, but still not operating now, finally, after many years of passenger line, hopefully that will connect 10, 15 kilometers into Nepal. But Kathmandu, for example, is at 1,400 meters altitude and still is not connected to the railway network of the region, forget India, right? Today, you should be able to take a train from Delhi to Kathmandu, from Kathmandu to Dhaka, from, Ka from Dhaka to Yangon. That is a state of disconnectivity. Without that, without doing this basic connectivity, you will not have, you will not have any success at any level in the neighborhood. So you can talk about strategy, about defense, about politics, but if you don't have this basic integration, this basic connectivity, it will be very difficult for India to assume, you know, its central predominant role in the region and beyond. Ria, shall we move on to our... So just, we will glance through this uh, very briefly. Okay, Ria, uh, just a few glimpses of the work we do. This is the initial brief we published early last year, Samban to Strategy, which explains a bit of what we shared with you here today on, it's on India's connectivity policy and what we try to do uh, in terms of visualizing India and its connectivity, uh, engaging different stakeholders, doing it interdisciplinarily. And of course, you know, serving in many ways the larger good and objective of reconnecting India with the region and, and pushing this public policy good, which is called connectivity in the region. So we look at, I think, different indicators, you know, just to give you a sense of 
we think of connectivity often only as infrastructure, roads, airports, ports, but there's various aspects of connectivity. One is an economic one, there's monetary flows and financial flows, there's transportation, electricity and energy, a lot happening there in the region. There are political connectivity indicators, how many times do ministers and prime ministers and leaders visit each other. In fact, I think the reference we had to the defense minister, the late defense minister, Manuha Parika, who visited Bangladesh, I think it was 2016, actually, we have to correct that, it was not 18, the first time he ever visited Bangladesh. But that's also a sign, right? The first time ever that an Indian defense minister visited the neighboring country of Bangladesh was in 2016. Since 71, there were bilateral relations, right? And that's a form of political connectivity of outreach. Technical conventions, how do you vote at the multilateral institutions like the UN? What's the coherence or incoherence between India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar when they vote? That's also a form of alignment, if you want. Maritime boundaries, many of which are unsettled still. Security issues, defense, military cooperation, border fencing and controls. Environmental issues, how do you manage joint rivers and basins, the mangroves, for example, between India and Bangladesh, uh, fisheries, air pollution, how, how, what conservation efforts you have regionally, bilaterally, multilaterally to conserve different flora and fauna, sociocultural migration, languages, cultural exchanges, education, media coverage, all different aspects of connectivity. So some of the publications, Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon, uh, uh, who was former National Security Advisor and former Foreign Secretary of India. Uh, we're lucky to have him as our distinguished fellow at the Center for Social and Economic Progress. And he just published a very interesting paper on South Asian frontiers. We just published this, I think, last month. Neighborhood first uh, in terms of disaster response and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. We published a piece there by Sanit Chakradeo, uh, our former colleague uh, at the Samband Initiative, uh, Ria's fabulous paper on India's integrated check posts, the ICPs, I think she should refer to them. This is the border control infrastructure that India set up with its land neighbors. Uh, we looked at education, at tourism, and also at development cooperation and transportation connectivity, for example, in the case of Nepal. Ria, over to you. Uh, we just want to quickly take you through some of the findings that we had in our different Samban publications and the different approaches that we have taken. Uh, the, first, uh, the first one that we had was on education connectivity, where we mapped uh, how many South Asian <coughs> students uh, out of the total foreign student population come to India for higher education. And it was approximately uh, 49% at that point. Uh, we mapped it in 2000. The last figure available was of 2018-19, and it was approximately 49%. That means half of for students from South, which means uh, students from South Asia constitute half of the total foreign student population in India. And this is a number that has been growing. While it did decrease for, uh, from 30% to just 9% in 1819, but since then it has been growing. And China now receives approximately the same number of students from South Asia as compared to India. We, um, we, drew, we took an analysis of how many students are actually going to I pref prefer India for, to, for education connectivity. And the paradox is that um, China approximately now receives, if you see the 2016-17 figure in the first graph, China now receives approximately the same number of students compared to India. And in fact, if you see numerically, Bangladesh sent in 2016, just 1,500 students to India um, and uh, 4,905 students to China, whereas Myanmar sent 17 times more students to China than India. So China, why is China rising as an education hub for, um, for countries which are closer to India? It's because, of, it's because it's offering more scholarship, research opportunities, better education infrastructure, that India has not been able to tap into, and there is a need uh, to improve upon this. The second uh, indicator that we looked at was intra-regional trade in South Asia, and uh, we 
didn't limit it just to the conventional South Asian countries, but we also included Myanmar in the neighborhood. And we found that uh, the intra-regional trade is as low as 5.6%, which is the lowest among developing country groupings in the world. Overall, in the last 20, 30 years, India's trade with uh, its neighboring countries has remained roughly between 1.7 to 3.8% of its global trade, with it being currently 3.6%. And China, as a result, has consistently, has, you know, um, come in and consistently increase its export to the region from 8 billion in 2005 to approximately 60 in 2018, a staggering growth of 546%. Despite the fact that China has only one free trade agreement in the region and India has um, several others, including a SAAP free trade agreement and the preferential trading agreement. If you see the pie charts below, you'll see the gap between uh, India and China's trade with the region. It's almost half. And um, the countries that are targeted are also different in this case. Tourism is another very important indicator that we tend to take lightly because tourism is something that forms um, our opinion about our neighbors and it's very important to, and, and, and we feel it's very important to study as an indicator of connectivity more so because 29% of the total foreign tourists who come in India globally consist are South Asians. And um, India has been working towards liberalizing its visa rules for the neighboring countries, not very effective for everyone because it's been done on a country basis, but regionally nothing is being developed as of now. We also compared it to the Chinese tourist arrivals in South Asia, which has grown significantly in the decade between 2007 and 2018. And the numbers that you see on your screen are um, you know, exemplary of that. We also, we, so we took at country-based case studies and we found that Bangladesh, among the South Asian countries, Bangladesh is the largest source of tourists in India. And, um, and we saw an inflection point where in, from 2013 to 14, the number had increased significantly. Going into the details, we found that tweaking rules can have a significant impact. You don't have to build a big, big infrastructure for it. For example, in 2013 and 2018, India liberalized the travel arrangement with Bangladesh as a result of which the number of tourist arrivals grew by 80%. Bangla Bangladesh of, Bangladeshi tourists, of course, come to India as um, for medical purposes as well, and that is a big factor that is being taken into account. We also made um, a visa index to see how open are South Asian countries towards each other. And we found that Bhutan, Maldives, and Sri Lanka have the most open tourism, uh, tourist visa policies with other South Asian countries. Whereas for India, only three countries are eligible for visa free, free travel, which is Nepal, Bhutan, and Maldives. This, um, this explains to you that if if, a simple, if you cannot even get a visa to go into your neighboring countries easily, this reflects on the kind of connectivity that you're trying to establish. Um, Dino, would you like to take it from Yeah, that? just in a nutshell, this is a, a, a study we did over the last 20 years of how India has come to the rescue of its neighboring countries after natural calamities, disasters, catastrophes. Uh, and it's an impressive amount of support. Uh, you've heard the term India as a first responder most recently articulated repeatedly. Uh, but here's a way in which India has really focused more on its neighbors, not only after earthquakes and tsunamis or natural calamities, but also often a water crisis in the Maldives, a drinking water crisis where the Indian Navy showed up to support the Maldives, uh, landslides, uh, sometimes uh, uh, food crises where India has dropped relief. So I think this gives another good sense of how India is reconnecting with the region. And also the many mechanisms it, it's used, sometimes more civilian mechanisms under the diplomatic system. Sometimes the military uh, uh, wings, the armed forces of India have played a very important role in providing relief to the immediate neighbors and being the first really showing up even before other countries in the world uh, 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 were able to provide relief. This is a paper we did published last year on how India uses its financial assistance. Uh, India has a very large financial assistance program, uh, which it calls development cooperation, where you allocate funds to other countries around the world that are other developing countries that require assistance. Uh, that can be in the form of grants, loans, lines of credit, 
scholarships, exchanges. So you're basically supporting other countries to grow. And that is particularly important in Africa, for example, where you want Indian companies to get lines of credit to export and to gain pro win projects in Africa. But it's even more important in South Asia uh, because of the strategy behind it, right? If you want to connect with your neighboring countries, it is in India's interest to build roads in Nepal because you can build roads up to the border, of course, of Bihar and UP, but if they don't continue on the other side, they're useless to connect with them. Uh, so the India has allocated tremendous resources to Sri Lanka, to Myanmar, to Nepal, in this case, to Nepal in these Southern areas to build roads. And as the paper is complex and large, but basically it tells you about the systems that India uses and the difficulties it has sometimes in allocating those funds and getting those projects off uh, the ground. Ria? Um, another paper that we recently, that I recently authored is, is on India's integrated check posts. These integrated check posts are basically um, sanitized zones from where trade and travel takes place with the neighboring countries. And we see that what has changed in the border areas after inauguration of these integrated check posts it has led significantly led to a rise in trade figures, definitely. It has led to rerouting of trade in some cases from sea to land, as we saw in the case of Pakistan with the inauguration of the ICP at Atari. And with Myanmar, there has been an increase in passenger movement. However, there are several challenges that come with this kind of infrastructure. So in some cases, they're only on the Indian side and not on the corresponding or not on the neighboring country side. And sort of, and it's... Um, the point that Tina was making that you can't have connectivity infrastructure just on one side, you need it to continue on the other for um, the seamless, to establish seamless connectivity. And we also see that since, you know, since a um, lot of regional connectivity arrangements are happening, the BBI and motor vehicles agreement, um, India, Myanmar, Thailand, trilateral highway. So how are they going to be routed? How will they pass through these integrated check posts? Well, essentially some form of checking of cargo takes place. Do you want it to be a seamless flow where, where um, cargo goes without any checking? Or do you want some people to stop and stop the trucks and um, increase the cost of doing trade by stopping the trucks and just checking everything in the, you know, in the vehicle? And there are some common challenges across ICPs in South Asia. It's, it's a little technical, but um, in the basic terms, we still use uh, paper-based transactions. Everything is, everything is put in a paper form. And there's no digitization at these ports, which are essentially located in remote border areas. There is um, the approach Rotino has already talked about, and there's limited warehousing space within these ports for cargo, which needs to increase. And we need to build more of these ICPs in line with other regional connectivity initiatives so that nothing is being developed in isolation and the different initiatives are connected to each other. Yeah, how long are we going to take more, Riyatina? I think we should end now. Um, uh, Ria, maybe this, I'll, I'll, this is a recent paper. If you want to look at an article we wrote on how India is using the consulates, uh, basically not the main embassies in the capital cities of neighboring countries, but consulates. India actually opened, I think, 14 now uh, over the last few years. Uh, and that's very important because you have in these smaller cities an Indian presence to flesh out the connectivity across borders. So that's something we published the South Asian Voices website. Uh, I think a few, two weeks ago. I think that's it, Ria. Let's end here uh, and we can come back to the upcoming research. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very, very much. Far more extensive than I thought it is. You know? Thank you very, very much. I learned so much more than I did. I'll not take too much time, but I'm not going into a larger picture. Just some uh, data points I thought could be interpreted slightly differently at times maybe. One, of course, is the very critical issue of trade. Is that one, India is not a trading nation. If you look at the as percentage to GDP, in that sense, it should have been much higher. It is much lower. And the fact that the trade baskets, export baskets of us and our neighbors has so much of overlap, it makes more sense to import from outside than to do from neighbor because it's simply not available to the neighborhood. You know? The kind of, we import a lot of electronics from China, as an example, or the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Obviously, you can't get to the neighborhood. So that South Asia necessarily has a lower trade to GDP. That does not, I'm not 
justifying it and really see that that's one factor. Of course, the larger issue is that you pointed out, there's so much more that could be done to facilitate trade. ICPs, of course, but otherwise also, how to make trade so much more seamless. On education, of course, uh, you know, the large number of Indian students who go to China to study medicine, that will probably distort some of the figures. So, of course, China is a more attractive destination for education globally than India is far ahead of us. I'm not even a comparison, you know. And tourism, yes, a very interesting point. The fact that uh, after we tweak things, uh, people from Bangladesh are able to come to India so much more easily than before. And as a result, I would say, and this is now sheer intuition, that uh, a lot of the economic traffic which happened before illegally has now become legal. So I think it makes so much of sense to move ahead on these issues and to facilitate it rather than force people to take routes. But yes, there's so much more to be done in terms of improving banking relationship and et cetera, all very important to bring about uh, closer, much closer interaction. And Uh, you're muted. Oh. I know. Somebody muted me. Can you imagine? Yuvraji, Kaura, right? Just because I'm not visible doesn't mean you can mute me. So, you know, you cannot become a larger world player if your own neighborhood you're operating at such low levels. So I think you've raised a very, very good philosophy point. I have lots of good people here from all over, from, of course, our university, from St. Davis College, Bombay, Mumbai, and internationally also. I see my friend Mr. Rajinder Pasai from the Nepali Congress also attending it. And so I'm opening it up. Do I have any raised hands? Anybody would like to? Because I'm restraining. I said I just made a point. So I'm not going to ask for questions. But yes, I'm looking forward to questions. But are we all very satisfied? I don't think so. We start very slowly normally, right? Sanjay, Akanksha, anybody? Go to see Kushi. Any questions? Before uh, the questions, can I just clarify one point? Yeah, please. Uh, the please. point that you were making on education that Indian students going to China would have distorted the figures. We actually didn't consider Indian students going to China. Oh, we consider the neighboring country students coming to India and the neighboring countries going to China. No, we very good. You know, Myanmar that's figures showed that 17 times to Myanmar. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I'm happy to be correct. I'm very happy to be correct. Rajiv, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is Rajiv Bhatia here. Uh, I have the chance oh, to... Bhatia sahab, how are you? Rajiv, I have written a book. I have No, <laughs> you, we are in a very informal setting. Uh, very useful to hear, uh, you know, such uh, detailed uh, research, which is based on uh, uh, solid uh, statistics, uh, even though... Uh, as we heard from Bria, data is a challenge. Uh, this is really the uh, view from the ground, uh, and that uh, is really uh, very useful. It helps us to understand the entire uh, landscape better. I have uh, two questions. Uh, I think one question is to Tino, and the other is to Ria. The first question is. Um, I know CSP uh, has made uh, a lot of, uh, has put a lot of focus on the word connectivity. And then they make a very wide definition of connectivity to include uh, relations or the relationship. So in traditional or classical diplomacy, uh, when we talk of say India, Bangladesh relations, then we include various facets, but here, our young colleagues are talking about not relationship, but connectivity, and yet they cover everything that is there in the relationship. So uh, how do we explain this? For example, you know, students, that would be regarded as educational cooperation rather than falling into, you know, what you describe as connectivity. So it will be good to hear your view. It is not that I'm challenging your view, but a clarification would be very important. And, uh, you know, this whole focus on ICP, integrated check posts, uh, you yourself are aware of their limitations. 
I know about one or two borders, particularly India, Myanmar. We keep hearing that uh, the ICP is there, and yet the bulk of traffic, the bulk of trade takes place uh, through the other channel. So let us say if there is a trade between the two countries amounting to thousand crores, maybe twenty, thirty, fifty crore is through ICP, and the rest keeps taking place. Uh, what would be regarded as nothing but pure smuggling. Uh, how do you react to that, and how do you try to situate in that uh, context? Thank you very much, sir. Would you like to take a couple of more questions, and then we can answer it, Bango? So, uh, Sanjay Pulipaka, and then Ayan Ali. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, congratulations to Tino and uh, uh, Ria Sinha for excellent work they have been doing. It's very useful for uh, uh, the research that we do on the neighborhood. Uh, the question that I have is, uh, what has been the impact of pandemic on these uh, connectivity projects uh, uh, in the sense that uh, new restrictions that have been placed, uh, there is concern that they may not be lifted in the case of, say, for instance, India, Nepal. And, uh, so uh, do you see a possibility of uh, borders becoming more rigid after the COVID? Or do you think this is a temporary phenomenon? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so am, I was, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, so it was a wonderful presentation and very insightful, very learning. Uh, my name is Ayan. I am uh, an undergraduate student in Jamia Millia Islamia. Uh, my question is, uh, so what do we do when politicians in our neighboring countries, when they play anti-India card or when they, uh, they, they storm to power on anti-India rhetoric or when we have like uh, the Chinese meddling into the political affairs and uh, heating up the anti-India rhetoric and like we had it in Sri Lanka. I mean, there was no open uh, links about that, but you know, there is a possible possibility that Chinese played over there and you know, uh, India and Japan were unilaterally pushed out from a very important and significant project by Sri Lanka. So in such situation, what is India's options or like, how do we cope up with it diplomatically or strategically, as we say? Thank you. Please go ahead with the answers. Thank you. All excellent uh, questions and, and uh, comments. Uh, and I think Ambassador Bhatia, uh, I, I, I think you're spot on. I mean, connectivity traditionally has been seen more from an economic and structural perception, right? Uh, and I think what we're trying to do, and this is maybe the explanation I have, is that we want to focus beyond the hard connectivity aspect of it, also on the softer side of connectivity, where you would put education, tourism, diplomatic engagements, political engagements. So basically the original term of the word to connect and to connect, you need to be on the same wavelength, you need to have flows, you need to have movement. So the answer is yes, we take a very comprehensive, I would say broader uh, uh, um, understanding of connectivity, precisely because we would not like to restrict the debate on the neighborhood just on the infrastructural hard connectivity of things. And they both go hand in hand. You cannot have just hard connectivity, bridges and ports if you don't have people crossing them trade happening through them, ideas moving across, uh, and, and that sort of softer, invisible, intangible engagement. And I think, that's why I think Mr. Sinan's point is very important about form, formalizing flows. Sometimes the flows exist, they have existed, in fact, and they have continued over the decades informally or illegally, however you want to call it, but informally. People, smuggling, movements, marriage, uh, all types of relationships of in the borderlands that have not been mapped and not have, been, have not been formalized. And I think the great challenge now, and if, in fact, Ambassador Menon's recent paper that we published addresses that very particular, is to how to formalize borders without hindering mobility. This is a big debate. And I can tell you, for example, between India and Nepal, it's a big discussion what to do with this so-called open border. Is the border really open between India and Nepal? Technically, on paper, yes, but everyone who's been to that borderland knows that it's very difficult to cross borderland. 
transportation is not there, communications are bad. So it's actually not, it's formally an open border, but it's more closed than other closed borders, than, more closed than other closed borders um, around the world that are, have fences, have controls, have checkpoints, etc. cetera. Uh, I'll leave uh, the question of um, uh, the post-pandemic effects to you, Ria, and anything you want to take, but just on uh, uh, Ayan Ali's question about the anti-India card. You know, my, my view on this, and I've been writing about this, please check some of these sort of columns I've been writing on this, why I keep saying pro-India people, anti-India people will come and go. Pro-China, anti-China people will come and go. Leaders will come. They'll get elected, rallying sometimes a bit more against India, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more for China. See, the politics will continue. But precisely the importance of connectivity and interdependence is that you want to insulate yourself from that political volatility. It's an insurance against that volatility that tomorrow if someone really inimical to uh, India takes power, then yes, it can matter. But then, you know, the people to people, the economic, the logic of economics will prevail. And the world is full of histories of, you know, countries that have not afforded to take animos animosity or sort of hostile stances to one towards the another because they're too integrated. Uh, and I think sometimes, of course, too much integration leads to irritants too. That's another issue. But, you know, I, again, I would um, caution you as you, you know, own studies on the neighborhood, not to pay too much attention to this sort of bombastic news about pro-China, anti-India. You know, it's a very sort of um, tactical way of looking at things. Every leader will be Maldives first, Nepal first, Bangladesh first, as any Indian leader will be India first. And the trick is how do you Con reconcile those two policies for a more integrated bilateral and regional relationship. Ria. Master Bhatia, for your question, uh, I do agree with you that the ICPs come with their own set of challenges and it's, and in the last, um, I would say since the inauguration there have, uh, since the inauguration of ICPs, there have been several challenges that have been overcome. Yes, um, informal trade is a is a major challenge in india myanmar border and the icp at more is has not been able to fulfill its potential in fact some of the exports still take place through the old land custom station because it requires a bridge to be built that's why i was making a point that these connectivity initiatives cannot be taken in isolation we build an icp but we, if we don't bridge a uh, if we don't build a bridge across for goods to cross then the ICP is of no use, right? We have seen um, in case of Nepal, in case of Bangladesh, that there has been significant diversion, um, that, that not significant, but there has been some diversion of trade from um, uh, trade, uh, informal trade to formal trade through the ICPs. And the process is still being streamlined to a, uh, to a certain extent. Um, I see that you've raised your hand. Do you have a question? Ambassador Bhatia? I think Mr. Bhattacharya wants to make a point. And there's a question from Nandi Bhattacharya after that. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. And this is a very fascinating discussion. I am not an expert, but I have worked on uh, borders and border trade to some extent. So uh, I'm a historian, essentially. And connectivity essentially relates to border. And border is was not there before the British came in this part of the land. So, but there were movements, human movements, trading movements, uh, seasonal migrations. So where, while we are, the Indian state is thinking about greater connectivity. Um, my question is, um, I, being an own expert, that is there any con consideration that the ancient roots would be revived to ensure better connectivity. Okay, wonderful. Mr. Bhatia, I think, has a connection problems, I think. Thank you, Austin. But before we uh, move on to Nandini ji's question, I have... Um, Adam's question Mr. from Pulipakas. Adam's also. Yes, Mr. Pulipaka's question as well to answer. And uh, someone... Uh, has... Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, um, 
Uh, Mr. Pulipaka, your question on what has been the impact of pandemic, I will speak from a perspective of what, what was happening at the borders and trade through the ICP was continuing. In fact, we even sent a record number of trucks to Nepal in this case. And uh, as a result of pandemic, it's a, it's, I wouldn't say it's a good thing, but some good developments have also been taken place at the ground level. For example, um, we now have a port health community system uh, comprising of medical officers at these at the ICPs across uh, with Nepal and with Bangladesh. That has been an incredible development. And also the focus on digitization has been much more. LPI has been revamping itself. A port community system is going to be put in place by the end of the year. So as um, I wouldn't say things, uh, things did slow down for some time with Bangladesh. Again, there was a domestic issue, a state conflict. But um, as a result of pandemic, some good things have also happened in the connectivity sphere, in the border areas particularly. Mr. Bhatia, I think, is back. Yes, sir. I saw the name figure up, and again, I'm missing it. Uh, Ria, there's a question from uh, Adams which says, how does the Sambandh initiative contribute towards connectivity in the Indo-Pacific region? Um, I think we alluded uh, to this point in the presentation on Indo-Pacific cooperation and the need for um, and the need to cooperate with third countries for different connectivity projects. We're already doing so uh, in the Northeast region for different projects with Japan and at these and uh, and just about two years ago, the foreign the foreign secretary said in a speech that Act East is an important part of the Indo-Pacific connectivity. And the projects that we do under Act East, whether it is bilaterally, whether it is with an international financial institution, is going to form an important element of, Indo of the larger Indo-Pacific connectivity that we're talking about. Thank you. So I think, let me now just do a quick, just a few points before we wrap up. We overshot our time, but it's been so fascinating that I'm glad it's sitting far away in a cold land called Russia, in the north part of Russia. I have connectivity issues myself, but uh, I think we really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, one very good point of data you raised, which we need to take seriously, especially not just think tanks, but universities also. How many people do PhDs on the economic structures of Bangladesh, of Sri Lanka, of Nepal, of Pakistan, actually even of China. Very few. You, I, I mean, I've been desperate trying to get around some better knowledge about the economics. I mean, why is Sri Lanka taken on so much debt? Unless you look at 20, 30 years economic developments, the change in public finance, I mean, you need to Diplomacy is not just about foreign leaders meeting and projects. Of course, projects are important. But if you don't understand many of the hidden motivating factors, I think we do tend to get a very wrong picture of things, you know. And therefore, the need for us to better understand, going back decades, better understand the neighborhood is very, very important. I'm glad to see a book yesterday, somebody posted it on how the Chinese have managed the transition of their public sector units. I mean, you must understand your neighborhood so much better if you have to really sort out all these, you know, if you have to do an optimal level of relationship with them, I think. So I don't see any other questions. So I'll now, Dulika are you around? Are you going to propose a formal word of thanks or should I do it? Sir, actually, Dulika sir, please connect. So, hum hai. But sign some. Your question about please send me the related papers and documents at such and such. Actually, in the website, par, everything is there. I'll send you the link on the website. I will send you the link of uh, the Samban thing, and you can access all the documents they are there. Put on. It's freely available. There's nothing secret about what uh, I hope there's nothing secret about CSEP does. So I think you'll get all the, the knowledge very easily available. So uh, let me thank both of you, I think, uh, Tino and uh, Ria. But really, I didn't realize it takes so long, but I'm glad it did. Because you really need to understand the complexity of it and the, I mean, all the variations and the nuances of it. It's easy to become simplistic and then come just to conclusions. I think it's far more difficult to spend a little more time and time to understand the interlinkages for one, the gaps for another, or how sometimes you need to take a larger view, but sometimes even procedural changes, procedural reform can make a difference. And to know the wisdom 
when do I need a grand strategy and when do I need just sorting out the micro details. That is something which only comes from very, very detailed work which you people are doing. I remember your discussions about the name. I'm glad you chose Samban. Samban is a strong word. And I think the work that you have been doing is absolutely fascinating. And I'm not just saying it as a matter of formality. I really think that I didn't realize how much work had been done on this and how all the different sectors, you know, who studies for the students or tourism so effectively. So I think all that brings out the challenges that we face going ahead. Must thank everybody who's attended it. As I said, students, non-students from Baroda, from Mumbai, from Delhi, from Nepal, everywhere. I think so nice to, to see everybody. Even now I can see people trying to enter the waiting room and saying yes to it. But people have kept us fascinated. You really, I hope it encourages more young people to be prepared to slog it out, to really work for the long term. Nothing comes easily and you can see so much of years of effort has gone into producing this. I think it is an encouragement. Kushi, you're trying to say something? Most welcome. Uh, no, it was just a clapping emoji. I'm so What's sorry. This, the the time. this has happened with me in this week. Kushi, at my age, I can't figure out a <laughs> clap from a raised hand. Okay. Now I know that I am an excellent clapping. presentation. Like really fascinating research. And congratulations to both Tino and Ria for this. And I see Ayanali is also Thank clapping. Now I know it's a clap and not a little hand. Okay. You. I'm glad to learn one more new thing today. So anyway, so thank you all very, very much. As I said, we do it every Friday. We'll have something for you next Friday also. And we hope that we join a larger family and help spread the word around. So that, as I said, we develop a much larger network of people who can discuss, hopefully argue also at times. Once again, thank you, Tino. Thank you, Ria. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Sohanam.